Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a patient who attended with bilateral blocked ears and I'm just commencing with this there right ear. And as you can see, this is full of dead skin as opposed to earwax. So sometimes it's difficult to distinguish the difference between um, earwax and dead skin keratin. Uh, in part, that's due to the fact that the majority of earwax is actually uh, made up of dead skin, around 60%. But I would say this plug is probably uh, about 80 to 90% dead skin, so I would therefore classify it more as a keratin plug as opposed to an earwax plug. Due to the consistency of this keratin plug, it's very difficult to perform microsuction, so I just reverted to the new rye correct and I'm slowly but surely extracting this dead skin plug forwards and out of the ear. So the new rye correct has several advantages in, in, my, in my opinion, uh, compared to the previous jobs and horn that I, I used. The first uh, advantage is that the end of the correct is a lot thinner, it's, it's more tapered, it's got a tapered end. And that tapered end allows me to glide in between stubborn wax and dead skin that's compressed up against the canal wall. Secondly, again, the distal lens at the end of the correct, it's more um, angled inwards. So it's, think about the geometry of a spade. It's got more of a, uh, a narrowed tip. And once more, I feel that allows me to glide a lot better, as you can see here, in between the wax plug, uh, keratin plug and the canal wall. And thirdly, the caret itself, and you'll hopefully see it again in a moment, it's got a curvature that mimics the curvature of the ear canal. And that uh, just means that there's less friction and contact, uh, or painful contact, should I say, against the canal wall. If you've got the geometry of the caret resembling the geometry of the ear canal as you're gliding it, there's going to be less resistance and friction, so therefore more comfortable for the patient. So just remove this last piece of dead skin. It's just got trapped at the entrance. Now, once I remove this keratin plug, you'll see the patient's ear canal's got a nice complexion. It's nice and pink. And that's a lot different to their left side. So do stay tuned because in their left side, and the left ear is the ear that the patient found extremely itchy. They were suffering from psoriasis, which is the medical term for um, itchiness. See, it's a nice complexion there. But the left side, you've got this thick adhesive layer of dead skin that I had to peel away. So if you enjoy your dead skin peels, do stay tuned. I'm just going to mop up now um, around the edge of some dead skin here. And a lot of this dead skin, it's on the boundary of what we call the osseocartonineous junction. Now, you can think about your ear canal... Um, or you can subdivide your ear canal in thirds. The outer third of the ear canal is made up of cartilage and the inner two thirds of the ear canal is made up of bone. And this skin that I'm removing is just at that osseocartonous junction. In some patients, it's, you're able to um, actually visibly see the boundary. And that's for the reason the bony part of the ear canal is typically more red and glossy and the cartilaginous portion is a bit more dull and matte in appearance. The physiological reason for that is all to do with the thickness of skin. Now, the skin that lines the outer third, the cartilaginous portion, it's about one millimeter in thickness and it's got three layers. You've got the epidermis layer of skin, which is the outermost protective layer of skin. You then got the dermis layer, which is the middle layer of the skin, which contains uh, elastin, collagen. It also contains the hair follicles and the erector muscles, which help these hair strands protrude outwards, as you can see. And then you've got the subcutaneous layer, which is a layer of insulating fat and connective tissue. And in between that layer of skin and the cartilage, you have um, a thin sheet called... Um, perichondrium and that supplies all the blood and the nutrients to the cartilage so the cartilage can uh, remain alive and sustain the same life itself. Um, now the bony part of the ear canal uh, is significantly different 
um, you only have the outer layer of skin, the epidermis layer of skin, which is about 0.2 millimeters in thickness. So, uh, or even less than that, 0.1 millimeters in thickness, I would say. And similarly to the perichondrium, you have a thin sheet called periosteum, which serves the same purpose as the perichondrium. It supplies all the blood and the nutrients to the bony part of the ear canal. Therefore, the periosteum is more visible on the bony part of the ear canal, and therefore you see, you're more likely to see the blood vessels. So for that reason, it's a lot more red. And the glossy appearance comes from the bone because it's a very thin sheet of skin. The bone is more visible in comparison to the cartilage, which is not as rigid or shiny as the bone. So we completed the right ear. Now, in this left ear, I removed that outer plug of uh, dead skin with relatively ease. And now I'm just peeling away all this dead skin. And underneath, you're seeing a more uh, healthier ear canal, which resembles the patient's right side. Now, this patient does suffer from otitis externa. They are, they previously been prescribed um, a spray in the UK called Otomize. So, Otomize contains three active ingredients. The first active ingredient is uh, an antibiotic uh, known as an aminoglycoside, and uh, more specifically, neomycin. And what that does, neomycin, if there is any bacteria in your ear, uh, within the bacterial uh, bacteria itself, there's uh, different structures, organelles, one called ribosomes, and ribosomes are uh, involved in protein synthesis. So there's two parts to the ribosome. Uh, one part reads the genetic code and it sends the other part of the ribosome out to collect uh, different amino acids, so amino acids, chains of amino acids form proteins, and it sends out the other part of the ribosome to collect different amino acids in the correct order, which then link together to form proteins. So what uh, an aminoglycoside does, it inhibits the function of that ribosome going out to collect the different amino acids to form proteins. So it doesn't basically starves the bacteria as opposed to directly like, kills it, you could say slowly but it just stops it from reproducing and replicating its genetic code. So that's the first um, uh, active ingredient. The second one is uh, dexamethasone, which is a steroid that helps reduce inflammation. So if you've got a tidal when swelling, it helps to reduce that. And the third active ingredient is, is acetic acid, which is essentially white vinegar. And that helps the ear to reacidify itself quite often in cases of otitis externa the pH level of your ear is increased. So our ear should be mildly acidic. And what the, the mild acidity does in the ear, our ears are full of natural uh, bacteria. We call it skin flora and also fungi. But the bacteria in particularly are um, sensitive to pH. Uh, most bacteria are what we call neutrophiles. So at a neutral pH, they, it provides the optimal breeding ground for this bacteria to, to multiply and potentially become what we call pathogenic. At a more milder uh, acidity, although these bacteria uh, still uh, reside in the ear, they're what we call non-pathogenic. They don't have the optimal breeding conditions and with, with, with some mild acidity to then cause the ear any harm. But in cases of otitis externa, uh, quite often the pH level is increased, which then allow these, what, uh, for some of these bacteria that naturally live in the ear to become pathogenic and it also allows other back harmful bacteria uh, out of the ear to enter the ear and cause mischief. So what acetic acid does, it just helps to reacidify the ear. It just tries to return the ear to its normal um, environment and pH level. Um, so Things that can cause ear infections are a change in pH, trauma caused to the skin, which then allows invading bacteria and fungi to penetrate into the deeper layers of skin or the periosteum and perichondrium, um, moisture, uh, humidity. Um, uh, so it's important you keep your ears dry. Um, and if they do get wet in any way, you can try and dry your ears out. There's several ways you can do that. One way is to use a hairdryer, but at a very low um, a power level and hold it from a distance and at short intervals. If 
on my hairdryer at home, I have an eco mode, which tries to um, uh, pump out air at a room temperature. And that's because our ears are sensitive to, to temperature. If the temperature is either too warm or too cold, you can suffer from vertigo due to the caloric effect. And I've discussed the caloric effect in previous videos. So I won't have enough time to discuss it in this because I've only got a couple of minutes left. But try to use room temperature. Alternatively, you can use uh, one part rubbing alcohol, one part white vinegar. You can mix it. This is a, a recipe from various ENT you can see online. And what the alcohol does, it, it binds with water molecules it, 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 and it creates an homogeneous solution. And alcohol has a lower um, evaporation temperature than water. So the alcohol binds to the water and it evaporates. That's why when we use rubbing alcohol on our hands, your hands become very, very dry. It attracts all the moisture, uh, which then evaporates. Um, and of course, the, the white vinegar, that helps to reacidify the ear. There's also another um, solution you can use. We sell it on our Clearwax website, only in the UK. We call it um, the Clear Relief Drops, and that contains uh, glycerin or glycerol. And it works similarly to the uh, rubbing alcohol. So it attracts itself to water molecules. Um, so it absorbs ex excess moisture. But glycerin or glycerol, unlike uh, rubbing alcohol has got a higher evaporation temperature than alcohol and also water itself. Well, well, probably just below water, should I say. So the, it still remains in the air, but um, glycerin is a, is a kind of an oily lipid structure and it helps to then moisturise the ear. So in comparison to the rubbing alcohol, which can sometimes over dry the ear, um, the, the glycerin, not only does it absorb excess moisture, but it that homogenous solution then helps to moisturize the ear canal. It coats it with the natural oils, which our ears should be producing anyway, through the sebaceous glands and the ceremonious glands, which are located on the outer third of the ear. So they're just little tips. I wouldn't go poking inside your ear to dry your ear, because if you have got any wax, you're gonna push it further in and you can cause trauma to this delicate layer lining of skin, which can then, as I said, lead to an infection. So, We've just peeled away all that dead skin. The ear canal looks a lot more healthier. The eardrum's fully visible now. It hasn't got that dead skin on top. That's the majority of the debris I removed from the patient's right ear using the, the right correct. And I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well. Uh, do stay tuned. I've got loads more videos to upload. Some really, really interesting cases as well. Speak soon. Bye.